Hello there, everyone. I'm Pastor Kirk Lehman. And I'm Pastor Daniel Walchmidt from St. John's Lutheran Church in Burlington, Wisconsin. We're here to continue with our Bible study in the Pastor's Study. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Jesus' passion account. According to St. Matthew, we looked at the account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then last week, we saw Jesus arrested there with that mob that came with Judas. And then today, we're going to be continuing to look at the trial of Jesus before the Sanhedrin. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 26, verses 57 through 68. Why don't we begin with prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of reading your word. We ask as we read your word today that we would grow both in our knowledge, but most of all we ask that you would uh, help us to grow in our faith and in our trust and in our love for you. We ask this in your most holy name. Amen. So I will begin by reading the whole passage, Matthew chapter 26, verses 57 through 68. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, at the beginning of the passage in verse 57, we see that Jesus was taken before Caiaphas, the high priest. What else do we hear about Caiaphas elsewhere in the New Testament? I think he's mentioned a couple of times, isn't he? Caiaphas, yeah, he's this high priest. Um, and the high priesthood, I mean, that was a position that goes back all the way to Moses. He had, he had um, written about that, and it was the leader of the, of the, the, the priests. Mm -hmm. The high priest is the one that went behind the curtain for the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. um, now, Caiaphas here is this high priest. Yeah, we do hear about him in the book of Acts, right? We do. We hear about him in the book of Acts. We hear about how uh, his father-in-law, Annas, was also a high priest. And we do hear um, from Caiaphas himself in the book of John. In the book of John, chapter 11, right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, it says that the uh, Sanhedrin got together and talked about Jesus. And during that meeting of the Sanhedrin, Caiaphas says something interesting. Uh, he says that it's better for one man to die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, when we Christians hear that, uh, we say, yes, it's true. Uh, Jesus did die for the people. He died for our sins. That's not what Caiaphas meant, um, but we, we recognize um, that in a sense it was true. That's one of the many areas in the Gospel of John where there is purposeful irony. Mm -hmm. John loved 
loves to bring in irony. There where Caiaphas speaks in John chapter 11, after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, that's when he says that, that very ironic phrase mm-hmm. that one must die uh, for the sake of the people. It's better yeah. that one die for the people. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, um, you mentioned Annas, the, the, the other high priest. How is Annas related to Caiaphas? Yes, Annas is the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And it seems that Annas had been the high priest, and right now uh, Caiaphas is the high priest. So maybe kind of Annas is like the high priest emeritus. Jesus, yeah. in a different gospel, spends some time before Annas. Mm-hmm. Now he's before Caiaphas. Right. So Caiaphas is this, this high priest. That high priest, um, there's actually many times that the Sanhedrin is mentioned and it appears that the high priest seems to be the chairman, so mm-hmm. to speak, or the president of this uh, Sanhedrin, this Jewish ruling council. Actually, at the, bo- at the end of the book of Acts, the apostle Paul is on trial before the Sanhedrin. And there, the high priest is named Ananias. Mm-hmm. Not Ananias and Sapphira, but a different Ananias. And... Um, yeah, so there he there he's before a different high priest. It must have been another succession that had taken place. Yeah, we do hear more about the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts. And we hear about it a little earlier in the book of Acts, too, because right after Jesus is raised from the dead, um, especially on the day of Pentecost, the disciples start to proclaim that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And then if you remember in the book of Acts, there is a healing, right, that Peter and John perform okay. in Acts. I think it's chapters 3 and 4. And then he... They are proclaiming the resurrection in the temple courts. And then they take Peter and John again before the Sanhedrin. So we get to see the Sanhedrin again in the book of Acts. And then a little bit later in the book of Acts, after Peter and John are before the Sanhedrin, we also see Stephen before the Sanhedrin. Um, So as we continue reading in the Bible, uh, we see this Sanhedrin again and again. when Peter says, we must obey God rather than men. That's right. Yeah, that's that time when Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin. And he was speaking to them, exactly. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's probably helpful to think a little bit about who this Sanhedrin is, their history. Their history seems to be, um, there's a little ambiguity there, especially keeping in mind that when we're reading about the, you could pronounce it Sanhedrin or Sanhedrin, here in the New Testament, remember that you have that entire intertestamental period, and then you have that, that time when the, the Israelites came out of captivity in Babylon. Maybe since then they had some kind of a council like this. Some people think that the history goes back even um, beyond the days of Ezra and Nehemiah earlier. But, but for our purposes here, you're kind of thinking about, well, when you think of the Sanhedrin, it's probably important to remember that in, in Israel... There, there isn't quite the distinction between church and state. I mean, mm-hmm. you, have, you have civil government and religious government kind of all wrapped up into one. Yeah. Um, so the high priest is the, the president or the chairman of this Sanhedrin, and um, they will deal with issues ranging from civic infractions to religious matters. And you kind of see that here with Jesus. This is a religious matter, but they want to put him to death because he's causing this uproar among the people here. And um, so what would a comparison be? Um, You could almost kind of, on a small level, you could think of like a city council Mm -hmm. and maybe a church council, Mm -hmm. except it's bigger than that because this covers, even though they meet in Jerusalem, this covers more than just um, Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. I mean, this covers the Jewish nation wherever there are Jews. So I'm just making a comparison, but it could almost be something like a country's body of representatives almost mixed with like a denomination's church leadership. I mean, you're talking about a group of people that's made up of priests, lay members, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, elders. It's Jewish leaders some of whom are priests, some of whom are not, um, that make up this larger governing body. Some famous members of the Sanhedrin would include Joseph of Arimathea. Mm -hmm. Who else? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. John chapter 3, the very first verse, I think, says that um, that Nicodemus was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So when you hear that phrase, Jewish ruling council or Sanhedrin, you're you're thinking the same thing. Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, and it's. I was just thinking as you were describing it there that this is the official leadership of the Jewish people, and now we have the Messiah uh, right in front of them, uh, and they put him to death, and it's just such a tragedy. And they've been wanting to do this for a long time. I mm -hmm. mean, you read through the Gospels, and all along, these Pharisees, Sadducees, Sanhedrin, they want to. They're looking for an opportunity to put him to death. And it happens, it happens right here. This yeah. is finally their opportunity yeah. to do so. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what, come, what comes next? So uh, in verse 58, we have a, a little uh, sentence about Peter, that Peter follows at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. And we're going to talk more about that next time because right after this section, in the section we'll look at next week, God willing, we will see um, how Peter disowned Jesus. So, but right now it just notes that while this uh, trial before the Sanhedrin is going on, Peter is out in the courtyard and it's going to kind of zero in on him mm -hmm. uh, next week in verses 69 through uh, 75. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what actually happens at this meeting, mm -hmm. at this meeting of the Sanhedrin where yeah. Jesus is in front of them, looking at verses 59 and 60. What stands out to you about 59 and 60, Jesus before the Sanhedrin? Yeah, it says, uh, certainly what uh, stands out to me is that they are looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. And what, what stands out to me is that we have one of the Ten Commandments, the Eighth Commandment, which says you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And that's what they are doing here. They are um, bringing false testimony against Jesus. Purposefully. Yeah. I mean, they're looking for false witnesses. And what stands out to me here. Uh, in, in connection with that is the timing of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Remember what just took place before this. Um, it wasn't just Jesus that celebrated Passover, but the whole city of Jerusalem, including all these members of the Sanhedrin, must have been with their families, um, mm -hmm. celebrating this sacred annual meal called the Passover. And now, just a few hours after that sacred meal, they're called in for a big meeting. Mm -hmm. It's late at night. Um, <laughs> I made a comparison to this. I said, you know, after a really important religious service or event, now we're going to have a, a meeting. It's kind of like if you had a church council meeting after your Christmas Eve service. It's mm -hmm. kind of like what this is. Yeah. So, you know, Caiaphas as the high priest gets the, gets the group together, you know, gets the, the council together and um, for this late night meeting. And in addition to that, it says they were looking for... Well, it even says, many false witnesses came forward. I, I just kind of think they probably had some of that prearranged. Mm -hmm. Like, we need you to come in here and give false testimony. And it's late at night. And maybe these false witnesses also had celebrated Passover. So it's just striking to me that here you have this deeply religious event in the Passover. And then they go right into breaking the Eighth Commandment. Maybe they had kind of a holy zeal. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just felt like, yeah, we're, we're Israelites. We celebrate the Passover. Here's this heretic. Let's put him to death. Mm -hmm. And that's, but that seems to be like why they have this hasty slap together meeting late at night after Passover. Yeah. And it, another thing that uh, jumps out at me is that uh, Jesus was purely innocent. I mean, they are looking for uh, things that he has done wrong and they can't find anything. Um, and that, again, uh, speaks to the complete innocence of Jesus. At the beginning of verse 60, it says, but they did not find yeah, any, not though, find though many false witnesses came forward. Uh, Jesus never did anything wrong his whole life. They couldn't say anything um, that he had done wrong. What they finally get him on at least in, in Matthew's gospel, they finally get him on this statement in verse 61. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Where did Jesus say something like that? He said something like that in John chapter 2. I remember I preached a sermon on John chapter 2 a while ago, um, a couple of years ago now, um, and I remember reading some commentaries on that, and they talked about how um, how they brought this up at Jesus' trial. Uh, in John chapter 2, uh, Jesus says, 
destroy this temple and I will build it again in three days. Mm -hmm. uh, and the commentators I was looking at, they uh, kind of pointed out that, um, well, uh, that's not exactly um, what is written here in verse 61. My point is that um, they had um, not said Jesus' words exactly. Um, in verse 61 here, they say, um, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Um, that's not exactly what Jesus said. What exactly what Jesus says says is destroy this temple. And he's not talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. He's talking about his body. And he says, I, and I will rebuild it again in three days. And he's talking about his resurrection. So he is not talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. Um, and he's not talking about rebuilding the physical temple in Jerusalem, um, which is what they are saying, um, which is what they are portraying him as saying here. Um, so here, even though Jesus said something that was kind of like this, um, it's still false testimony. Yeah. The high priest, Caiaphas, as he's presiding over this trial, they're bringing forward the witnesses and everything. When you get to verse 62, to me, as I read it, he almost seems exasperated. He almost seems like a desperate cry. Like mm -hmm. he wants this to go quickly. Jesus isn't answering. He says, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? And then you have that sentence uh, that Jesus remained silent with mm -hmm. this, this dignified silence. I think mm -hmm. our Savior knows these crazy accusations are beneath him. I mean, why should he, why should he try to scramble and defend himself against such silliness? Jesus yeah. remains perfectly silent. Yeah, that's right. And then the high priest says to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. Um, do you have any comments on that? Uh, things that, things that we've heard earlier in Matthew's gospel, um, about the Messiah, the son of God. Maybe just think of what those words mean. Messiah, Christ, those are two words. Messiah is a, is a Hebrew word. Christ is a Greek word, but they both mean the anointed one. So Jesus is the anointed of God. He was anointed to be our Messiah, our Savior. And then, of course, the phrase Son of God, that's used um, a number of times Jesus, the Son of God, I think of the centurion after Jesus dies, they say, surely this was the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, Peter uh, says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Um, at the baptism, uh, the Father says that Jesus is the Son of God. On the Mountain of Transfiguration, uh, the voice from heaven uh, says, this is my Son uh, whom I love. Um, so the, the Son of God. Um, you John 3.16. Yep, John 3.16, you, you certainly. I, I remember some years ago, and I'd like to hear your comments on this, I was reading, maybe just reading some commentaries or some scholars about um, thinking about what exactly does Caiaphas mean when he says, um, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Uh, what does Caiaphas mean when he says the Son of God? Um, and uh, I, guess, I guess the point is, is that, um, is, is Caiaphas thinking that Jesus is claiming to be God? Um, and, you know, I, I'd like to hear your opinion on it, but my opinion is that Jesus had um, claimed to be God, right? In, 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 in John chapter 8, um, Jesus claims to be God. Um, and so my personal opinion is that when, uh, when the high priest asks him, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God, um, I don't think it's out of the question that the high priest is thinking of the Son of God in a divine sense. Well, I think so too. But I think Caiaphas has made up his mind that Jesus isn't. Cor correct. You know? That's right. So as he asks this, this is kind of bait and switch. I mean, if you, I'm going to ask you this question. And if you say no, then what that's going to mean for you is, then that means your earlier claims that you're a liar and a yeah, hypocrite. That's good if you say yes, we've got you. Mm -hmm. Because we all know that you're not God. And if you say yes... Forget the witnesses. We've mm -hmm. had a whole bunch of witnesses at this trial, and they've kind of been bringing some silly reports. But if we hear from your own mouth 
that you claim to be the son of God, then it's a done deal. And you're, right. then you're done. You're going to the cross for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's the road it goes, isn't it? Um, that Jesus says in verse 64, you have said so, Jesus replied. And it, you don't wonder, you kind of wonder about what that means. You have said so. In the gospel of Mark, um, Jesus, or Mark records Jesus' words in a more straightforward way. Um, in, in the gospel of Mark, um, it says, I am. Am, which is a faithful representation of what uh, Jesus said. Um, here he says, you have said so, um, but certainly in what Jesus says after you have said so, um, really um, confirms that by you have said so, Jesus means yes, <laughs> yes I am. Yeah, he's um, affirming that he's he affirming is. He's affirming that he is. And so he's, he, he discontinues being silent. He was silent before, but now when it comes to tell us plainly if you are the son of God, um, he does. He, mm -hmm. he says it plainly. And uh, Jesus affirms that he is, in fact, the Son of God. Yeah. And then it, verse 64 is a little bit of a tough verse because he goes on to say, but I say to all of you, uh, the NIV 84 says, in the future, how does the NIV 11 say it? The NIV 11 says, from now on. From now on, and I think that's a faithful representation of what the Greek says. Um, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, certainly, what, what makes us think about this is that certainly Jesus is referencing Judgment Day here. When, yeah. will, um, when will they see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven? Well, that's certainly a reference to when Jesus yeah. comes on the last day. It's this, this passage uh, could be referred to in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. In Revelation 1, verse 7, it says, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, so even those who put him to death, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. So Jesus certainly is talking about Judgment Day here. Coming and, with the clouds in, in Revelation chapter 1. I'll just add mm -hmm. that in, in Daniel chapter 7, same kind of language. Yeah. Uh, I, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven, approaching the ancient of days, led into his presence. So again, this picture of Judgment Day that's spoken of in Revelation and in Daniel and now Jesus is referencing it here about himself. Absolutely. And, and it's going to be finally fulfilled on Judgment Day. Um, and then what, but what kind of makes us wonder more is that Jesus starts it out by saying, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of yeah. the Mighty One. Um, and Jesus did not appear to uh, Caiaphas, uh, after he had, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, and so it kind of makes me scratch my head a little bit and and, and wonder, um, in what sense did um, Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin um, see the Son of Man um, sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven? And kind of my thought is that they didn't see Jesus raised from the dead with their physical eyes. But Matthew's going to tell us in Matthew chapter 28 that the Sanhedrin heard a report from the guards who were at the tomb. Yeah. Um, and so they certainly heard a report from those very guards of what had happened, um, that the angel had come and had rolled the stone away, right? Not only um, the report, but just, just all the events that happened. Yeah. Right? I mean, you have the earthquake, right? You have... Um, Probably they got a report from the centurion, right, mm -hmm. that said surely this was the Son of God. The the curtain in the temple tearing in two, I mean, that was yeah. a big deal. Right. There were people that were raised from the dead mm -hmm. um, at this time, so that must have made the news too. Right, exactly. And then and then in the book of Acts, um, they are going to hear reports about um, Peter and John healing the lame man. Um, and I, I, I was just looking through Acts last night, and it says that they saw the lame man um, who was made well standing right in front of them. So they saw evidence of the disciples doing miracles in Jesus' name. Um, also, um, later on, on in the book of Acts when Stephen is before the Sanhedrin. Um, Stephen says something that's similar to what Jesus says here. Um, if you'd like to turn with me, uh, I think it's a really interesting passage in Acts chapter 7, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. 
Acts chapter 7. Now, Stephen is before the Sanhedrin. Verse 55. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so verse, verse 54 mentions the Sanhedrin. So it says, When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. And then, and then yeah, verses 55 and 56. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And then in verse 56, he says something very similar to what Jesus says to the Sanhedrin. Verse 56 says, Look, Stephen said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And so the, the Sanhedrin um, didn't see this with their physical eyes, um, but I think that that um, goes a long way in, in explaining the from now on, that finally on Judgment Day, they would see Jesus coming with the clouds of heaven. Um, but before that, they would, they would hear all of these reports um, of the resurrection. Maybe another way of saying that very same truth, which I think is exactly right, is that all along they were just hoping, put this crazy rabbi to death and be done with him. Mm -hmm. But by crucifying Jesus, they were in no way done with him. Yep, that's I right. mean, yep. he um, risen from the dead and, and the movement called Christianity, his followers, their worship of him, um, the Sanhedrin, the world was far from done with Jesus. Yeah, that's Even right, though yeah. they wanted him to be done, that's why they crucified him. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Well, we keep talking here about this Sanhedrin and the high priest. Back to verse 65 here in Matthew 26. The high priest tears his clothes, and then he references blasphemy. And what do you make of that word? What is blasphemy? And was Jesus committing blasphemy. Yeah, blasphemy. I looked in our I looked in the Greek lexicon um, that we use uh, and it said that blasphemy um, is uh, really like like disrespectful talk or insulting talk. And you could um, blaspheme another human being if you say something insulting about them. Um, but the word blasphemy is especially used um, for uh, disrespectful or we might say irreverent talk about God. And here, um, Jesus claiming to be the Son of God, um, the high priest certainly considers that um, to be blasphemy. Um, one thing that I one thing that I thought of is that you know um, biblical scholars will sometimes talk about irony in the story. What I think is very um, ironic in this story is who's actually the one who is blaspheming? Uh, is it Jesus or is it the Sanhedrin? Um, actually, the Sanhedrin is the one who is blaspheming, um, and certainly later on the cross, uh, when Jesus is on the cross, the Sanhedrin um, or you know members of the Sanhedrin um, are going to be um, saying insulting things about Jesus. Um, so the irony here, I think, is who's actually the one who's blaspheming? It's not Jesus. He's telling the truth. Um, the Sanhedrin are those who are blaspheming. They're the ones blaspheming. That's a great point. Maybe another piece of irony here in this whole thing is that, speaking, speaking of irony, is that Jesus speaks the truth. They ask him, are you the Son of God? And and he affirms that he is, and yet that is what he's condemned for. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, here we have this Sanhedrin, lying, breaking the Eighth Commandment. But now Jesus tells the truth, and that is what lands him on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. You can see in verse 66, what do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And, um, and then... I guess the last verses of this section where it says they spit in his face, struck him with their fists, slapped him. They said, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? Um, yeah. Is that kind of shocking? <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just very um, surprised here by how over the top uh, the Sanhedrin is um, with their cruelty. Um, certainly any cruelty is wrong, but just how much cruelty there is um, is really quite shocking here that they spit in his face and strike him. It's just really, um, really quite awful. I mean, if you, if you think of what this Sanhedrin is, this is an official governing body. If you think of official governing bodies in our culture, even a, even a judicial court, I mean, you don't have, you don't have the judge 
and you don't have um, people in the courtroom, you know, physically abusing a defendant, right. even if the defendant is found guilty. Yeah. Because you think that that's beneath, you know, the high court. But right. here we have the high court, and yeah. it's, uh, it is, it's disheartening, and it's disgusting. And we're going to see the Roman soldiers do a lot of this later. And I'm a little bit less surprised to have Roman soldiers mm -hmm. being cruel to their to their criminals, mm -hmm. but the Jewish ruling council. Yeah, yeah. What about where we'll, we'll get to it eventually? But um, do you see any differences um, or kind of comparing well, the uh, the the trial here because there's two trials. The first one is here before the Sanhedrin, and then next they're going to take him before Pontius Pilate uh, to have another trial. Um, we'll get to that eventually and look at that in more detail. Um, but do you have any comments on um, just how um, these two trials compare? When you look at this trial before the Sanhedrin, remember you're talking about a religious Jewish court. Um, so Jews, priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, that's who makes up the Sanhedrin. Later on, when you're before Pilate, you're before Roman officials. And it's noticeable the difference in what they accuse him of, or even what the discussion is. Mm -hmm. Here, the discussion is, um, he's going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Here, the discussion is, tell us if you're the Messiah, the Son of God. It's very religious themes mm -hmm. that, that they're discussing. When you get to Pilate, Pilate's not interested in Jewish rabbinic laws or anything like that. Pilate is interested in if Jesus claimed to be a king. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of that king discourse. Are you a king? My kingdom is from another place. You hear about that in John. And um, that's the kind of language that Jesus has with Pilate. Mm -hmm. Here, it has, uh, has nothing to do with whether he's a king or not. It has everything to do with if he's blaspheming, defaming the name of God, if he's claiming to be God. And that's kind of the difference that you're going to see when you look at his trial before the Sanhedrin and then his trial before Pontius Pilate. Yeah, that's right. So here um, we see Jesus uh, before the uh, Sanhedrin, and would you could we think for a minute about just um, what what does this uh, help us with with our faith? Um, that what does this tell us um, about Jesus? Um, that you know it's Holy Week right now as we're recording mm -hmm. this. Um, what can we see about Jesus in this section? What things can we see um, that really build up our faith? Uh, in this section. Do you have any initial thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, one thing that comes to mind is this idea that it was all the way back in John chapter 2 that he mentioned, just, you know, destroy this temple and it'll be raised in three days. All the way back at the very beginning, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, he knew that he would be raised from the dead, which implies, of course, that he knows that he's going to die. Um, he heads resolutely for Jerusalem, on his mission to die for us. So maybe this scene helps us understand the agony he felt in the Garden of Gethsemane because the disciples didn't know it. Caiaphas might not have even really known how this would go, but Jesus did. Yeah. Jesus knew he is going to be maligned and accused by fellow Jews, then by Roman soldiers. The cross was looming. I think that that shows you the determined love of our Savior, that yeah. he, he knew it was going to happen, and he faced it bravely and resolutely for us. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly That's one right. thing, I think. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. You know, other things I think of, you know, think about, and we think about the meaning for us in verse 64. From now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven, to think that we also are going to see him uh, in in glory coming on the clouds of heaven and just to really look forward uh, to that day um, because that's going to be the day of our salvation. To use some themes that we've kind of been focusing on at least here at St. John's recently, the crucifixion, his death, his trial, this is sort of the depths of his state of humiliation. Mm -hmm. Jesus references sort of the um, the heights of his state of exaltation with him at the right hand of God, returning to judge the world. Um, so all along, you have um, Jesus, he looks like this criminal that's going to be crucified. He looks like this weakling. But the terrible irony, of course, is that the Roman soldiers are putting together 
the God who will sit at the right hand mm-hmm. of the Father and judge the world. Yeah. That's who's on trial before us yeah. today. Yeah, Maybe true. we do well to focus on this and then keep the big picture in mind yeah. that this is who Jesus is, this is what he's doing now, this is what he will do soon. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes. Does that seem like a good note for us to end on here as we... Uh, you know, wrap things up and then move to the next section? Yeah, I think so. And next week we're going to see um, that while this is going on, um, that we're going to join Peter uh, outside and we're going to see him uh, disown Jesus. Um, But then um, we'll remember, as next week is Resurrection Week, um, we'll we'll remember that Jesus is going to restore Peter um, and that uh, Peter and all of us uh, will see the Son of Man uh, coming on the clouds of heaven um, in power and great glory, and he'll be coming to save us. Very good. Should we close with prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, this day, as we read your word and see the suffering that you endured on our behalf, we thank you from the bottom of our heart. And we ask that this reading and your passion would strengthen our faith in you as our Savior, you who faced the cross and the suffering that it entailed on our behalf for us. Bless all Christians this holy week as they walk that path again that leads to the cross and to the empty tomb. Here as we continue to live in a coronavirus world, I pray that you would be with those who have lost loved ones and those who are affected by this coronavirus due to illness within their own family. Please heal them. Please bring comfort to those who have experienced loss. Please spare us, Lord. We boldly pray that you would spare us, our congregation, our families, our community. And we pray that you would bring this pandemic to an end in swift and due time so that we can, again, serve you by worshiping you in your own house. But until that happens, Lord, remind us of all the ways that we can serve you and grow in our faith here. Um, even apart from being within within your own house. Uh, Bless us this Holy Week, Lord, and thank you for this time together. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us again for Bible study in the pastor's study.